How can you improve your egg quality? Hello friends, I'm Dr. Natalie Crawford. I'm a board certified OBGYN and REI. I'm a fertility doctor. And one of the top questions I get asked is, how do you improve your egg quality? How do you have better quality eggs? What does egg quality mean? Is egg quality the same as your AMH or your ovarian reserve? And I'm gonna break down this for you in a very quick video. But first, this channel exists to help spread information about your body and your fertility. And I would love it if you would subscribe and follow along. Second is I do have a course you may or may not know about called the Enhance Your Natural Fertility course. And there's an IVF course. You can go to nataliecrawfordmd.com slash courses to learn more. All right, well, first of all, we have to understand what is egg quality. Egg quality essentially means the genetics of the egg. When we think about your egg, your egg is actually containing all of the chromosomes that you have. So a female karyotype is 46XX. Inside your egg, from the moment you were born, these chromosomes are held connected to each other, 23X, 23X, and they are held in this perfect position. This is actually called metaphase of meiosis, and metaphase means in the middle. So these chromosomes are paired up in the middle. And I don't know why the ovary is made this way, but your eggs are held in metaphase of meiosis from the moment you're inside your mother's womb. And they are like this until you ovulate in which they separate. And then you get what we think of as traditionally the egg 23X, able to be fertilized by sperm and then become either 46XX or 46XY. So, the big thing here is understanding that these chromosomes are being held apart by these meiotic spindles, which are proteins, keeping them in their perfect alignment. And the longer they sit there, the more these proteins are going to break down and the increase in abnormal splitting. So what happens is those chromosomes are going to then not split evenly and you're going to get an egg that is not 23X. This is called aneuploidy abnormal chromosome number. And so age is the number one determinant of egg quality. And you'll hear every fertility doctor tell you that. And that's just because there's more wear and tear if those eggs have been sitting there for a longer time in metaphase, there's an increased chance for something to go wrong. However, there are some things that cause these proteins to break down faster. And there's some things that may slow down the degradation. And so this is why we are starting to have more and more evidence that the world around you, what you put in and on your body, the environment of which the eggs are growing in really does matter when it comes to egg quality. You cannot turn back the clock. That is why if you are going to undergo IVF or egg freezing or try to get pregnant, Younger is always going to be better because youth can trump other things. However, we want to be able to have the best eye quality we can. And so understanding what modifies this helps empower you to understand what you can do. Quick differentiating factor between egg quality and egg quantity or ovarian reserve. Ovarian reserve is talking about the number of eggs that you have. Now, you might be young and therefore have a better egg quality, but you still could be running out of eggs early and have low ovarian reserve. These two things are independent. The one thing that is consistent is that as you get older in everybody, you will have fewer eggs. And as you get older in everybody, the quality will decrease. It's just, they're not always together. Egg quantity can be checked with a blood test called AMH and an antral follicle count. And essentially we're measuring how many eggs do you have remaining? So the two things that are going to determine IVF success is the number of eggs you have, ovarian reserve, and how old you are, essentially egg quality. I do have videos on ovarian reserve and AMH if you want to go learn more about that. All right, so unfortunately, the egg is a single cell filled mostly with water and it has DNA inside of it. And so I can't test that DNA, it's one cell. I will destroy the egg. So there's no test for egg quality. I can't just run a blood test and look at your eggs and say, oh, this percentage will be genetically normal. However, we can look at age-related norms and say, okay, what will likely be normal based on your age? And this is data from infertility studies where we are testing an embryo. So egg, single cell, genetics, purely maternal, 
embryo fertilized egg, maternal paternal genetics or egg sperm genetics. And an embryo, when it grows into a multi-cell stage, traditionally now is biopsied at the blastocyst stage, which is around 300-ish cells. And you can take some cells from the placental component called the trophectoderm without damaging the embryo. So we can test an embryo. We can't test an egg alone. And this is one of the big limitations if we are doing egg freezing is that I don't know really for you how many of your eggs are genetically normal. I am going to make some presumptions based on your age and that's all we got to go with. We have to roll with those presumptions. This is one of the advantages of making embryos is that I do know for you, you have this percentage normal. Disadvantages to making embryos obviously is you're more expensive, there's more involved, and also it's connecting you with one sperm source indefinitely, and that may not be your desire. So trying to optimize your egg quality is going to result in higher chances of getting pregnant naturally, but also especially if you're undergoing IVF or egg or embryo freezing, you wanna do everything you can to optimize this. If we look at data, the percentage of embryos that are genetically normal, if you're under age 35, then typically it's around 60% genetically normal. If you're around age 35, then it's gonna be closer to 50%. If you're age 37, 38, it's going to be closer to 40%. If you're 39, 40, it's going to be closer to 30%. 41, 42, closer to 20 to 25% normal. And then over age 42, it's typically 10% or less. And that is of the embryos you send. Now, if you only send one embryo and you're age 42, the odds are it's not going to be normal. However, we don't know that for sure. And this is why sometimes you're gonna hear your doctor say, in order to make the math work, you may need to do multiple cycles, do this cycle and then another one, get another group of eggs, in order to have the math work out to find a genetically normal embryo. If you're older but you have a higher ovarian reserve, the math is gonna be more favorable. If you're younger, even though you have a low ovarian reserve, the math is still probably okay. When you get older and you have low ovarian reserve, this is when you start to really need to understand your chances of success. All of that said, how do you improve egg quality? That's what this video is about. The number one thing is to understand that your eggs are extremely sensitive, held in this metaphase phase. So toxins are extremely toxic, like their name. So BPA has been shown to have a negative impact. Phthalates have been shown to have a negative impact. Things like cigarette smoke, man, we know that decreases the quality and the quantity of your eggs. Marijuana is also decreasing the number of embryos and their quality. So these are all toxins in the world around you. So stop smoking cigarettes and marijuana, look at the products, stop drinking out of plastic, stop cooking food in Teflon, stop microwaving plastic, start transitioning your beauty, your kitchen products over to being less toxic. Those little changes make a difference because these forever chemicals build up in your bloodstream with more and more exposure. And we have data showing that they impact the stability of that genetics inside the egg. Now, another big category here is going to be inflammation. Inflammation and chronic inflammation is toxicity inside the body. Inflammation can come from a variety of different things, and I'm a believer that the body is all one connected thing, meaning it's unrealistic of us to think that if you don't sleep very much, that your body's gonna be functioning at its peak performance, even if you feel fine. Because the reality is, like, hey, let's go through it. Sleep, number one. Sleeping is when your body heals cellular inflammation. That's when your cells are healing. It's when everything is reprocessing. It's when you're clearing toxins. So if you don't sleep a good seven and a half to eight hours every night, you're not getting that benefit. If you are highly stressed, your body is running in a flight or fight mechanism all the time. This causes a really high cortisol level, and this is shutting down the pituitary gland, but also causing inflammation because your body is not going to be digesting and clearing toxins as it should because it's ready to run from a bear. Now, the human body was not made to live in this chronic stress world that we live in, and stress is very broad. And maybe it is your work, maybe it is an illness, maybe it is emotional stress or trauma, but all of it matters, and addressing that one way or another is important. This is why things like acupuncture, meditation, therapy, counseling, yoga, whatever it is that can cause you ah, to take a moment away from your stress 
to have a release from that cortisol can be extremely beneficial to your healing. And so I say 30 minutes a day, whether it is walk with the birds, go get acupuncture, meditate, do yoga, journal, read, whatever it is for you, you need to do it. And then we have diet. So there are definitely inflammatory foods that we know about, processed foods, added sugars, and red meat. Those things are all inflammatory. In fact, the more servings that come from vegetable protein over animal protein appear to be better for the body. Dairy is controversial, probably looking at low fat versus whole fat, but the body wasn't meant to consume a lot of animal protein and things like dairy, the whole fat dairy is probably better than the low fat because of the processing, putting in synthetic things to keep it looking like milk is more inflammatory than the body than just having your whole fat dairy. So what I recommend from a dietary standpoint for my patients is a diet that is low inflammatory. So that is gonna be whole foods, a variety of fruits and vegetables, do not restrict them. Whole grains, complex carbohydrates. You do not need to avoid gluten unless you have a sensitivity to it, which if you have Hashimoto's or thyroid disease or autoimmune disease in your family, you may have a sensitivity to it. I also recommend low sugar, low processed food. So you're just consuming a variety of dense nutrients, giving your body what it needs. Now, does this mean you can't have cake ever? No, like live your life, but being low inflammatory most of the days to benefit your eggs and your entire body. And then it's not going to be a huge issue for your body to be able to process a toxic eating. You know, if you have a piece of cake and it's inflammatory because it's your birthday, your body will be fine with it because it's not chronically challenged with inflammation all the time. And then we have supplements. So CoQ10 is probably gonna be one of the top ones. This helps support the mitochondria, which is the powerhouse of the cell. We also like to see folic acid, omega-3 fatty acids. Those omega-3s are really important in cell development. And so that is essential when it comes to egg formation. We do see worse quality with vitamin D deficiency. So making sure you're taking extra vitamin D. I recommend everybody take a thousand IUs extra of vitamin D in addition to whatever's in your prenatal. Look for omega-3 fatty acids, EPA and DHA that are either in your prenatal or take them separately. CoQ10 in its best studies has been 200 milligrams a day, three times a day. So if there's CoQ in your prenatal, you might need to take a little additional. Then we're gonna get into things that are specific for your circumstance. So if you have endometriosis or you really have some other inflammatory disease, high levels of vitamin C and vitamin E. And acetylcysteine can also be helpful. Myo-inositol if you have PCOS. If you have low ovarian reserve, DHEA may be helpful to improve androgens. So those are not something that you can just go take everything. You need to take very specific supplements and so talk to your doctor about that. Overall, staying a healthy weight because being overweight is also inflammatory. So think about sleeping, eating healthy for your body, taking supplements, being a healthy weight, and then movement. I don't recommend like stressful, intense workouts all the time because that does cause inflammation. Does that mean you can never work out really hard? No, of course, working out is great for your body, but make sure you're treating your body with kindness and you're giving yourself plenty of time to rest and recover. Hope you found this video helpful. As always, you can get more information on the As A Woman podcast or follow along on Instagram at Natalie Crawford MD. Thanks, friends.